What if I told you that back in 1999, you could pick up an entire desktop computer for $99? That's right, not 500, not 1000, and no, not even more, just $99. Personal computers were certainly becoming more and more affordable back then, but even still, getting the lowest of the low end machines would cost you at least a few hundred dollars. So, what on earth was going on here? Well, let me open your eyes to the eye opener an all-in-one internet appliance from the appropriately named Netpliance that was sold between the late 90s and early 2000s. And I've got one of them that's been sealed in its box for over two decades. So in today's video, we're gonna open this thing up for the very first time and talk about how a simple IDE cable ended up becoming the catalyst for the death of this company's entire internet appliance business. Sponsored by Linode, cloud computing from Akamai. Hello everybody and welcome back to another video. So if you don't remember internet appliances, these were basically really low cost computers that were designed to be an easy and straightforward way to get on the internet. Although they were far more limited than full-fledged PCs, they had the upside of being a little bit cheaper. And the eye-opener wasn't just a little cheaper, it was hundreds of dollars cheaper. Because when this thing launched in November of 1999, it sold for a promotion price of $99. Now, Netpliance's strategy was to basically sell this thing for so cheap to really attract consumers and establish themselves in the internet appliance market. And it was so cheap that they actually lost money whenever they sold one. Because this thing came equipped with a 180 megahertz wind chip CPU, which was an x86 compatible processor, 32 megabytes of RAM, 16 megabytes of flash storage for the operating system, and a 10 inch 800 by 6 100 LCD display. Hardware that, according to Netpliance's own admission, gave the eye opener a manufacturing cost of $500, meaning that this company was losing 400 bucks every time they sold one of these things. Now you're probably asking, well, how on earth was that sustainable? Well, Netpliance's business model was based on selling the eye opener itself at a loss and then making a profit through the $21.95 per month subscription internet service that you had to pay for to actually use this this thing on the internet. You could not use an existing plan with another ISP if you already had one. And remember that this $99 was a promotional price, which on the surface doesn't seem like that bad of an idea. However, it ended up backfiring on them majorly. And we'll talk about how a little bit later on in this video. But for now, let's go ahead and crack this thing open and see what $99 would have gotten you back in 1999. And just like that, there is no turning back. So, it looks like we've got some reading material in here. Uh, this first piece of paper is probably going to let you know that you have to call, yeah, you gotta call them to activate your account so you can actually get online with this thing. And it looks like if you're activated within 24 hours, you can get 5% off on a Canon Bubble Jet 2010 color printer. So, uh, yeah, a little bit too late for that now. And here, We've got a setup diagram which walks you through, you know, taking the thing out of the box, plugging everything in, and turning it on. Uh, it's printed on a pretty decent quality piece of paper here. Uh, and right here, we've got the getting started guide. So this is going to be kind of like the manual. Uh, it looks to be 20 pages long, and this is going to walk you through things in more detail, of course. Uh, it takes you through some of the features. Uh, how to turn it off, you know, on and off, volume control, display contrast. Here's a uh, key map of all the keys on the keyboard. Speaking of the keyboard, one of my favorite features of this thing. Uh, well, let's actually get this out of the box. So it looks like right here we've got the phone line. We've got the power brick over here. And we'll just go ahead and uh, take these styrofoam pieces off. And so there's the machine itself. And here is the keyboard. Now, yes, my favorite thing about this keyboard, hands down, is that it's got a dedicated pizza key. Yeah, this would actually open up the ordering page on Papa John's website. So you could, just, you're literally one keystroke away from ordering a pizza, uh, which I find to be probably one of the coolest uses of a key on a keyboard ever. Uh, and here is the eye opener itself. We'll go ahead and uh, remove it from its, let's find the, there it is. Now all we gotta do is rotate the bottom stand like so, and then we stand the machine up on that, and then we rotate the display and uh, peel off that lovely 
uh, shrink wrap here or, you know, protective plastic layering on the screen. Now you've probably already noticed that there's no mouse included with this thing. And that's because the pointing device is actually integrated on the keyboard. So on the right side of it, you've got this pad that you can, you know, press up, down, left or right. And this is how you move the mouse pointer around on the screen. And on the left side of the keyboard, you've got the equivalent of your left and right mouse buttons. Now, NetPlines did sell an external mouse for this thing. It cost $19.99. So if you wanted to go that route, uh, you could. But yeah, let's take a look at the computer itself here, or the internet appliance, I should say. So on the front, you've got your power button, you've got your volume slider, you've got your contrast controls, microphone, you've got indicator lights up there, and uh, you've got your speaker on the left and right of the display, obviously. Taking a look at the port selection, you can see that uh, with the keyboard connector here, they've actually made it semi-permanent, although it's not really permanent at all because you can remove this. They've just uh, put this door here over the connector and you have to unscrew it, but it is a standard PS2 connector. And you've got a single USB port, you've got your printer port here, uh, modem and all that, and you also have a uh, cutout, interestingly enough, for like another USB port. They've even got it labeled here, but they don't actually actually use it for anything. Uh, and you've got your power connector here. This is how you get access to your RAM. So if you wanted to upgrade that, well, you can. Uh, but, you know, the target audience of devices like the eye opener was probably not going to be doing that at all. Because, you know, again, these were meant to be low cost, um, easy to use machines for novice users that just wanted a simple way to browse the web, check email, do that sort of stuff. And although NetPliance and the eye opener have long faded into obscurity nowadays, I do find it rather funny that uh, they referred to this thing as an internet personal access device or iPad for short. And on their website back then, I found a quote that says, referring to the iPad will be as common as that first eye-opening cup of coffee in the morning, which is absolutely a true statement nowadays, but just not like they intended. So uh, yeah, funny little coincidence there. But let's go ahead and uh, plug this thing in, power it on, and we'll take a look at the pre-installed operating system. All right, so we've got the eye opener set up, and for this demo portion of the video, I'm actually going to be using an entirely different eye opener model. This one right here is a later revision, and the reason I'm using it is because this one was actually used back when the eye opener service was still online. So there's a bunch of cached data on this thing that I thought would be pretty cool to go through and take a look at some of it. But we will come back to the eye opener that I just unboxed later on in the video to do some pretty cool stuff with it. So the first thing it's going to do upon boot up is let you know that it couldn't connect to the internet. So we're just going to say no here to uh, get out of that. And uh, that message will come up every so often. And here we are on the home screen. And you can see that we've got this nice circular menu with a bunch of different options and we will go into each of these as we go throughout this demo portion of the video we're going to start with mail now if you're wondering what os the eye opener runs it runs qnx which is a unix like operating system that is stored obviously on that 16 megabyte flash module and what's interesting is when I started going through this stuff off camera, the mail application, there's a lot of messages in here, especially in sent mail. You can see there's 353 messages, but there's also some in the mailbox itself as well. So we'll hop in there. Now, I'm not going to show you all of these, obviously, first of all, you know, for time's sake, but also because there's a lot of personal data contained in these messages. But there are a couple of interesting ones, uh, like this Canon uh, email here, take 10% off your next Canon order from the 27th of December 2001. So judging from the dates in the email messages and in other areas on the system, I've determined that this thing was last used around early 2002. So let's open it up. And I've actually not taken a look at this. Oh, it's got to connect to the internet. Okay, okay. So yeah, this is the connection screen that you'll see whenever it dials into the network. But you notice there that we had some news headlines going across the bottom of the screen there. So that's kind of a nice touch. All right, so I was able to stop it from connecting to the internet. So here it is. And you can see we do have a bunch of missing images, but we've got this text here. Uh, this is kind of screwed up. The formatting of it is. Let's see if we can highlight this to... Uh read what this says uh let's see nope we cannot <laughs> that's interesting um okay well it says introduce you to something that can make life easier the canon e-store it's a place where you can shop 24 hours a day seven days a week i assume 
Uh, yeah, the formatting is like way screwed up. So you would get an extra $10 off your order of $60 or more if you shopped at the Canon e-store. And you've got some products here, the Canon S630 printer, some paper, Canon inks, and this right here looks to be from AT&T WorldNet. Now you probably saw their logo on the home screen earlier. The reason why that's there and the reason we've got this email in here is, and I will go into some more details later on in the video, but when NetPlyant shut down their internet service for the eye opener, they partnered with AT&T to have them kind of take over as the ISP, at least for a short while. And this is an email letting you know that uh, AT&T was apparently discontinuing service for the eye opener on December 31st, 2001. But yeah, here's what the email interface looks like when you've got a message open. So we can scroll down here and uh, you know, read the rest of this email. You've got all your information up here from sent to subject date sent, and you've got some options along the bottom. Speaking of sent, let's go into sent mail here. And uh, this is where, like I said, most of the emails, uh, like the 99% of the cached emails are all in this folder. All right, well, here's one from May 22nd, 2001 called gas prices. It was forwarded. Look at that, that is a photo of somewhere where gas was 159 a gallon oh and <laughs> okay okay I, I i just noticed the arm and a leg um man can you so obviously they thought that 159 a gallon back then was like nuts which i mean with inflation and everything it probably was in today's dollars that is 274 which uh yeah i would gladly take that <laughs> than what we're currently paying for gas. Now, I know that we can't actually connect to the internet to, you know, browse the web and, and, and stuff like that, but obviously this thing, with it being so old, it's not like we're gonna be able to go to any modern websites or anything, but even back when this thing was released, there were complaints about the web browsing experience because the browser only supported HTML 3.2 at a time when HTML 4 was the latest. And I saw a couple of reviews of this thing where the authors mentioned that they had trouble navigating to sites with heavy JavaScript, and there's also no Flash support either. Uh, another big gripe is there's no external storage of any kind. So if you wanted to like fire up a word processor and write something out quickly and save it somewhere, well, tough luck, there's not even a word processor on here. And that was another thing people complained about. But to be fair to the eye opener, it's not like this thing was really meant to be a computer replacement like you're not I mean this wasn't designed to be like an office machine for you to do word processing and stuff on it was just meant to be an easy gateway to the internet but you can actually write documents on this thing and at least print them out by going into write mail here. So you can use the email composer as a de facto word processor of sorts. So I could just type out whatever I want and then click on the print button down here to print it out, or I could save it to my drafts to, you know, save a copy of it. So there are some ways to, to save files and stuff, but it is, it is extremely limited. You cannot download files from the internet, for example, and store them somewhere. But yeah, so you got email. We'll hit the home key to go back to the main menu. You've got shopping. And look at that. It actually lays out the different categories here in sort of a mall directory floor plan design, which is kind of cool. You also got some hyperlinks down here. View directory, view stores A to Z. Uh, they've just got like, I assume all these are going to be websites, right? Like if we go to appliances here, we'll just click on that. And yeah, so you've got Sears here. We can just open up this and it should, um, yeah, take you to the web browser. Now, remember when I was saying that this has some cache data? Well, it's actually got some news headlines. Of course, it's gonna fail to connect again, so we'll just say no. But yeah, you've got a bunch of websites that you can go to and here's the full directory. Uh, so you've got even like, oh, look at that. Amazon.com is under kids. Oh, it's also under consumer electronics. Okay, it's probably in a few different categories here. Yeah, music and video. Oh my gosh, Circuit City. You guys remember that? Uh, of course, we got the eye opener site. So yeah, pretty uh, decent selection of uh, department stores and, and, and stuff here. Of course, they're all just links to these various websites, but it just lays it out nice visually for you. We'll go into weather here. There is some cached weather data. Uh, so here's Sunnyvale, California. It doesn't show the, the date when this information was pulled, but uh, whenever it was, it was 57 degrees Fahrenheit. Uh, it was rainy. Winds from southeast at eight miles per hour, 93% humidity. Uh, let's see if we hit details here. Maybe it'll give us the 
update. Oh, okay, here we go. 4 a.m. Pacific time, Wednesday, January 2nd, 2002. We also got Palo Alto and Santa Clara here. We'll just click on Palo Alto. And let's see if we can go to maps here. I'm curious if this will load up. Okay, today. Yep, that's going to try to connect to the internet, which we're just going to back out of that. Uh, so, yeah, you got some maps. And yeah, all those do exactly the same thing. And of course, it's going to error out again. But yeah, so you got weather. Uh, next up is finance. Here's a Reuters headline from the 2nd of January 2002 at 3 p.m. Stocks trim their losses on Wednesday afternoon, lifting tech shares into positive territory as investors balance hopes for an economic rebound against nagging fears that share prices have outplaced corporate profits. There's the Dow, NASDAQ, and S&P 500. You got some headlines down here. Next up is entertainment. Let's see what we got going on here. So we've got pretty much the exact same uh, layout here that we had in the finance uh, browser. And that's the thing about, you know, it's not like these are applications per se, like it's not a finance application or an entertainment application. These are just uh, categorized websites and news headlines. So now we've got entertainment focused ones. We go back here, we go to sports, we go into that and we'll have sports focused headlines and you got a you know a bunch of those over here but it is really neat to see all this stuff because you know it's like a, it's like a time capsule literally i mean this is some sports headline from uh let's see the 2nd of january 2002 at 4 p.m and speaking of news we've got news which although it says abcnews.com here that's actually the sponsor so you see they have sponsored by abc news up here but this headline is from reuters uh, and if we go uh, if we go back here and go into uh, sports, it's the same thing. It's sponsored by ESPN, but these are uh, Reuters headlines. I think all of these are. So we can go in here and yeah. And you've got your web guide, which kind of does the same thing that the shopping. I almost said application, but saying application seems kind of wrong because these are just really like websites. Uh, what the shopping option does, where it kind of categorizes various websites for you to go to. So like I click on news here. And, uh, you know, it will display some news websites. We got health and fitness. Let's go to maybe entertainment here. So you got like the yellow pages, white pages, Ticketmaster, TV listings, all that stuff. And you just click on uh, search the web or browse the web here too. We'll click on search the web because the search page will actually pull up here. Uh, though we're not actually going to be able to make a search because it will try to reach out to the internet. Now you also have on your keyboard here, you've got shortcut keys to all of these options uh, and more. Of course, it's going to come up with a no dial tone warning again. So I can hit web guide here. I can go to the shopping area. I can go to my address book. I can go to mail. You know, we did not have the address book option because that's within mail. I got weather. I've got news. So we are missing the entertainment and the uh, sports news, you know, buttons that are on the home screen here. Uh, you also have a hang up button if you wanted to quickly, you know, get off of the internet so that somebody could use the phone. And the pizza button, if you did not believe me, will open up papajohns.com. Uh, and we can see that if we go to expand here, it will uh, try to load papajohns.food.com, excuse me. You've also got a help option down here. If you were confused about anything, you could hop in here. They got a few different help categories. This is also where you can change preferences for things like your modem, if you had to uh, dial a prefix for you know dialing an outside line, stuff like that. We can go back to home. And you also have this tell a friend option permanently on the screen because again, iOpener or NetPliance was losing money on every one of these things that they sold. So they really wanted you to tell as many people as possible about this thing so that they would get more customers and have more people pay for the uh, subscription internet plan. And that is a perfect segue into what I think is the most exciting part of this video. And that is talking about NetPliance's major, major screw up with this thing. Because you would think that if their entire business model was based on selling the eye-opener itself at a loss and then making a profit through this subscription service, that they would make you buy the subscription service when you purchase the eye-opener. But this wasn't the case at all. So there was theoretically nothing stopping you from purchasing the eye opener for $99 and then just never signing up for the subscription service. Of course, you couldn't really use the eye opener without having the subscription service because you just couldn't do much with the existing operating system that's on here. But what if you desired to install an entirely different operating system like Windows 98 on this thing and just use that instead? 
and you can probably see where this is going. Only a few months after the eye-opener was released, an electronics engineer named Ken Siegler discovered that it was alarmingly simple to get this thing running another operating system. All you had to do was take the eye-opener apart, connect a hard drive to the unused IDE header on the motherboard, boot into the BIOS to change boot devices around, and you were good to go. With one minor caveat, the IDE header did have its pin swapped around, likely to make it more difficult to do this, so you'd have to make a crossover cable like this one. And if you didn't know how to do that, Ken was willing to sell you a $35 kit, which included the crossover cable, hard drive bracket for mounting a hard drive in here, and a PS2 splitter so you could plug both a keyboard and mouse into this thing. And once Slashdot picked up on what he was doing, well, <laughs> there was no stopping what happened next. Because once people found out that these things were basically $99 Windows or Linux boxes, orders went through the roof. Some people were even purchasing more than one. And Circuit City, who was NetPliance's main retail partner, received so many orders that entire warehouses were cleared out. Which in normal circumstances would have been great for NetPliance, but remember that they were losing money on every single eye opener that they sold. Though surprisingly, they initially welcomed the increase in attention, believing that only a small minority of people would actually make these modifications. However, they quickly realized how wrong they were and began to try and make this process a lot more difficult. Starting out with annoying things like cutting the IDE pins on the motherboard so that you would literally have to solder a new connector in, and creating updated BIOS revisions to disable booting from other hard drives. In fact, this eye opener right here doesn't even allow you to boot into the BIOS setup utility. But people were able to find ways around this stuff, and some were successful in getting even these later revisions to install Windows or Linux just fine. What they could not get around, though, was the change NetPliance made to their terms of service that, to be honest, should have been in there from the beginning for the company's own sake. By April of 2000, customers purchasing the eye-opener had to agree to pay for three months of the internet service plan and were charged $500 for canceling before then. And this is where things go from irritating to downright illegal, because customers who had purchased eye-openers directly from NetPliance before this change went into effect, discovered that they were getting billed for the internet service even if they never signed up for it. And NetPliance had backdated the charges to two days after the customer's order was shipped. So it didn't take long for the FTC to notice what they were up to and file a suit against the company. And not only did they find out about the unscrupulous billing practices, but they also discovered that NetPliance did not provide any local access numbers for customers to dial into. Meaning that you would incur long distance phone charges every time you use the thing. Unless, of course, you just so happen to live in the same area code as whatever number they were using. And by the way, this would happen even if you went the entire month without actually using the eye-opener, as the machine would periodically connect to the internet on its own to get updated data. In their complaint, the FTC argued that NetPliance had failed to properly disclose both the automatic billing of the internet service plan and the additional long-distance fees that customers would incur. And they also found some of NetPliance's advertising to be deceptive, saying that the company's implication that the eye-opener's internet-related features were equivalent to a regular PC was inaccurate, pointing out that users could not download files or send photos through email, among other things. So in July of 2001, NetPliance decided to settle the charges brought against them, agreeing to pay back all customers who were illegally billed for the internet service plan and paying a $100,000 civil penalty. NetPliance did try to make the eye-opener a little more profitable for them by quadrupling the price to $400 in mid-2000. But at that price, you could just buy an e-machines or something instead, so the writing was pretty much already on the wall by that point. However, they did not just shut the entire thing down. Instead, NetPliance formed a partnership with AT&T, whose WorldNet dial-up service took over as the ISP for existing users. This is why the unit I've been demoing here has their logo up at the top left. However, only a few months after that, NetPliance sold off the entire service to Earthlink, who became the next ISP for eye-opener users. But that didn't really last long either, and although Earthlink is still around today, NetPliance is not, and thus the eye-opener gradually faded into obscurity. But you know what hasn't faded into obscurity? 
the cloud computing service is offered by today's video sponsor, Linode. There's been a few mentions of Linux throughout this video, and the virtual machines Linode offers are a great way to set up a Linux environment to host anything from simple websites to complex applications. And if you've been looking for a provider that has the tools and infrastructure to scale and deploy your project, they've got you covered with a worldwide network of data centers, all equipped with enterprise-level capabilities like load balancers, object storage, and Kubernetes. Plus, with their predictable no lock-in pricing, you can start small and upgrade to a higher tier in the future if your needs increase. For the past two decades, they've been making cloud computing affordable, accessible, and simple. And they'd love to have you try them out. So as a thank you for watching this video, if you sign up for a new Linode account by clicking my link down below, you'll receive a 60-day $100 credit to give them a test drive for completely free. So whatever your hosting needs might be, go ahead and check them out. And huge thanks again to Linode for making this episode possible. Yeah, that is the really intriguing tale of how a bunch of hobbyists were able to outsmart this entire company all by using an IDE cable. And it serves as a very important lesson in the world of business. If you're going to have a loss leader like this, make sure you have a surefire way of making a profit somewhere else. So yeah, that's a little history of this thing. And that is a demonstration of how you were supposed to use it. Now I'm going to swap units again. We're going to get the older model back up here, which by the way, has a date on the box of April 7th, 2000, which is a couple months after all these shenanigans started going down. So we're going to crack it open, hope all the IDE pins are there, and for the rest of this video, try to get Windows 98 running on it. Okay, so getting the eye opener to run another operating system gets more and more difficult with each hardware revision. In total, there are six of them that have been documented. Mine turned out to be a V2, which meant that this process was still pretty straightforward, albeit with a little more work involved. Though it could have been much worse because this was around the time NetPliance began cutting the pins on the IDE header. However, this seems to have been done arbitrarily because my unit had them intact. Others were not so lucky though. Now taking apart this thing is pretty easy. You just have to take off the stand, remove some screws from the back to take off the outer plastic piece, and then remove some more screws to lift the metal shielding out of the way. And one of the first things I noticed is how large the heatsink is. It makes sense because this thing doesn't have a fan, but it drastically limits how we can fit a 2.5 inch hard drive in here. Some people took this thing to the max and upgraded the processor, replaced the heatsink with one that had a fan in it, added a beefier power supply, and cut holes in the plastic casing to make everything fit. It didn't always look the greatest, but it made for a fun project PC. I opted to keep everything simple, so I took the heatsink off since it was covering the IDE header and repasted the CPU because, well, the paste on this thing was over 20 years old. And I discovered that the best way I could do this without cutting a bunch of holes in this thing was to connect the hard drive up and rest it on top of the motherboard to the left of the heatsink. I had to do away with the metal shielding because it stuck out too much when I tried to screw it back down, and I also had no way of mounting the hard drive. So I just left the hard drive where it was and took the back plastic piece and screwed it back on. I know, I know, this is a very jerry-rigged way of doing this, but it worked surprisingly well, and the hard drive being sandwiched in between the two plastic pieces was actually enough pressure to prevent it from moving around. So I set the eye opener back up and connected a regular PS2 keyboard to it so I could press Control alt escape upon boot up to enter the BIOS setup utility. And it will recognize the new drive as the primary boot device, or as this BIOS denotes it, Drive C. But it has booting from it disabled by default, and is set up to boot from Drive D, which is the internal SanDisk flash module. However, if you modify this to allow booting from the hard drive we just installed, the system will fail to boot. And this still happens even if you outright disable Drive D altogether by setting it to none in the BIOS. Now, I had already installed a copy of Windows 98 on this drive to make things easier, so there was a bootable partition on here. And this is where we get into some of the quote-unquote improvements that NetPliance made to the BIOS, as they have modified it to prevent booting from other devices, even if configured properly in the setup utility. But it turns out this was done rather hastily, as the original BIOS version version and the utility used to flash it remain on the SanDisk drive. 
This isn't the case in later revisions, however, but it is possible to write a disk image containing these files to a drive that you then connect to the IDE header to boot from and flash the BIOS, at least on a V3 unit anyways, as that's what this guide I found was written for. And apparently, if you configure that drive manually in the BIOS with the same geometry as the internal sand disk drive, it will be able to boot from it. In fact, I initially started to go through this process thinking that my eye opener was a V3 before discovering otherwise. Once I confirmed that it was indeed a V2, all I had to do was set the BIOS back to factory settings, boot up into the eye opener's operating system, and press tab 4444 before the tutorial loaded to bring up a command line interface. From here, I navigated to app ztest and ran QNX flash to downgrade the BIOS to the older version. After a restart, I immediately noticed that the boot screen had changed, which was a great sign. And sure enough, when I went back into the BIOS setup utility to modify the boot order once again, Windows 98 began to boot up just fine. And it is certainly a sight to see because, oh my gosh, after going through all that troubleshooting, it's definitely exciting to get Windows 98 up and running on this thing. Now, you can probably tell that we don't have any drivers, really. We're just using all the basic stuff here. If we go into my computer, uh, and actually I've swapped back to using the regular iOpener keyboard because I don't have a PS2 splitter uh, to you know split between a, a regular keyboard and mouse. And the USB port does not work. I need to have a driver installed. But honestly, we're kind of getting towards the tail end of this video as it is. I mean, this has been a pretty long episode, and I definitely want to explore this some more now that we've got Windows 98 on it. Um, I'm thinking of doing a follow-up of, you know, getting proper drivers installed and seeing how this thing performs. Um, but, you know, the, the thing is that we have to keep in mind with this thing is, again, there's no fan in this at all. So if you were going to do like more high CPU intensive tasks with your eye opener running Windows 98 or Linux or whatever, you probably were going to want to modify the heat sink and, you know, cut a hole in the back to mount a fan in there. And we might end up doing something like that, uh, though I do really want to keep this thing intact. Although I do have that other one that I can keep intact, so this could be kind of our project eye opener. So yeah, there's the computer specs right there, and if we go to device manager, you can see just how, how much stuff we gotta get drivers for. But, I mean, just the fact that it loaded up here uh, and, and that we've got it running, I mean, that's enough of a victory for me, at least uh, for this video. So, yeah, if you guys want to see more eye-opener shenanigans, be sure to uh, give this video a thumbs up and get subscribed and leave a comment down below. And uh, let me know what you think about this thing. Let me know if you ever used one of these things back in uh, the late 90s, early 2000s. And if you ever got Windows 98 or another operating system running on it, because uh, that would be pretty cool to hear some stories of, you know, actual people using these things back then. But uh, yeah, that is going to wrap it up for this episode. Uh, I hope you guys enjoyed this one. If you really enjoyed this one, and if you want to get early access to my future content, I do have a Patreon down below that you can check out. But either way, I just want to thank you all so much for watching, and I will see you in the next video.